Great, thanks very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the this wonderful session on um, preventing violence against children in armed conflict. So I'm just going to go through a few of the uh, housekeeping things that you've probably already heard if you've joined uh, sessions already. But if you can, while I'm going through these, if you can click on the link in the in the chat for the Mentimeter icebreaker activity, which the question is what protection <laughs> risks are you seeing for children in conflict zones? Um, so if you can go ahead and do that while while we do the introduction, when, then hopefully we can catch up on time. Uh, so as I said, I'm Erica Hall, and I am Policy Manager and Strategic Advisor at World Vision UK, and I am thrilled to be hosting this session, uh, to be facilitating hosting this session. Um, again, how to participate. Please uh, unmute if you're in a quiet space and speak up if you want to contribute. That's absolutely fine. If you're able to keep your camera on, uh, if you can, we know that's not always always possible. It would be great so that the speakers know they're not speaking into a void. Uh, and also we can make this as much like an in-person meeting as we possibly can. If you, when you do that, you don't want to see yourself, as I know I hate to see myself, um, you can click on your, um, click on your name and hide your, so it's hide self view, um, clicking the three dots next to your name. Also to make you aware, we are recording the session. So we want everyone to feel comfortable to share openly, uh, but we also want to make sure that as many people as possible uh, can see the presentation. So that's why we're recording. Um, during the session, we will be using interactive tools such as Mentimeter, as I've already mentioned, uh, and also group maps. So hopefully, you won't have too much trouble. Um, you can put things in the chat if you're really struggling, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to access those. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of the session, uh, it focuses on tools and evidence for protecting, uh, protecting children from harm, uh, particularly protecting those who are affected by armed conflict, as I said. Uh, we have three exciting presenters, and I can't wait to hear them. Uh, we'll look specifically at preventing recruitment and, uh, and use of children, and also community-led child protection uh, for preventing wider harm. So do we have Mentimeter results before I introduce the presenter, or do we need to give a bit more time? I think we could gather a few more. Um... We've, okay. we've got we've got a few going up that it would be nice to get, get a few more. Okay, brilliant. So let me first introduce you to the presenters. So we have Sandra Menio, who is the CAFAG, Children, Children Associated with Armed Forces and Armed Groups Advisor at Plan International. Uh, and then Hannah Jordan, who is the Regional Protection Advisor for Norwegian Refugee Council. Jasminka Mila, Mil Milo Vanovic, I said it earlier perfectly, Head of Advocacy for Save the Children Ukraine. Um, Caroline Veld, who's a uh, Senior Child Protection and Emergencies Advisor for Save the Children. Lots of presenters. Also, Dr. Catherine Bailey Abidi, Director of Research and Learning at the Dallaire in Institute for Children, Peace and Security, as well as Tim Lynam, who's a data scientist at the Dallaire Institute, as well as managing director of Reflecting Society. So we have massive amount of, of incredible experience here. And let's see what people quickly, before we go into the presentations, let's see what people are saying um, so that we know, so that all of the speakers know what's going on. It's interesting that child recruitment obviously seems to be coming up quite a lot, along with other worst forms of child labor, uh, gender-based violence, um, child marriage, uh, again, violence against children generally, kidnapping. Yes, it's quite, it's quite uh, distressing. I, I think we all know from what we're seeing, uh, we're seeing day in and day out in our work. So, right, so that we can move on quickly uh, I, I think it, that will keep scrolling. I know we're going into Sandra's presentation, but it's really interesting 
to see what what people are saying. But let's start with um, Sandra. So Sandra is going to start with a presentation of a toolkit for developing interventions to prevent the recruitment and use of children. And Sandra, the floor is now yours. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. Right, so um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Sandra Mignon. I'm working with Plan International as a CAFAG advisor. And today I'm going to talk about how to develop interventions to prevent the recruitment and use of children. So this tool is part of a, of a toolkit that is developed under the CAFAC task force. And so we have a reference group with various organizations who are contributing to the development of this tool. So this uh, toolkit is called a program development toolkit. And the objective is to design quality and gender sensitive projects for the prevention of recruitment, the release and the reintegration of CAFAG. So as you can see, this tool encompasses like a wider, um, wider objective. It's not only focusing on the prevention of recruitment. We also focus on facilitating the release and promoting the reintegration of children within their family and community. But today I'm going to focus on the prevention component of this toolkit. So we are going through a number of steps for the development. We started with a field research. Then we developed a draft of the toolkit that was then validated by a reference group. And we're now in the pilot phase in three countries. So we are, have already piloted the tools in Central African Republic, in Burkina Faso, and we started in Afghanistan. We had to stop the pilot there, and now we have shifted to Iraq. So once we collect all the feedback from the, the final pilot in Iraq, we can do, uh, we can finalize the toolkit, which we hope will, uh, will be early next year. So now let's look at the content of this toolkit. Um, so first we have some guidelines. We have, um, so those guidelines are for field practitioners to know how to design this quality and gender sensitive programs. We have also a set of um, training materials that includes a um, training um, guide. We have some tools, we have some handouts and PowerPoints, and we have a set of tools, particularly for the context analysis. So this toolkit uh, um, is looking at the project cycle. So we have like, the various steps of the project cycle. And so we start with, with first with some background information, which um, provide information on the legal framework at the international level, also how children are affected by the, by the recruitment. So these are more like general information. And then we move into the first step of the project cycle, which is a context analysis. So there we have guidance on how to collect data that is specific to each context that will then inform pre-program design. So the context analysis includes various methodologies. We're looking at a gender analysis, a risk assessment and needs assessment. And we also, we have a strong component of child participation. So children are involved in all of those tools. And we have some tools that are specifically designed to engage former CAFAG. And then we have the second step, which is the program design and strategic planning. So there we are talking about program design, how to develop a log frame with outcome indicators, uh, human resources. We're looking at budget as well. Um, then we have the third step, which uh, is focusing on implementation and monitoring. So here we talk about child safeguarding, data protection, monitoring how to measure indicators, um, capacity building of human resources and coordination. And the last step is the learning and evaluation, which will then inform the next uh, project cycle. So today we're going to focus specifically on the program design um, component. Um, this here, we're going to look specifically 
at the prevention program design. So it's a very specific component uh, of this um, of the whole toolkit. And um, so now let's look at the target audience for this toolkit. So we are looking at government actors, national DDR commissions, UN agencies, national and international NGOs who are involved in uh, programming for, for CAFAC. And we're looking more specifically at people who are involved in project design in project management or in project review. So the project review here, we are thinking of people who are technical advisors, for example, or who are, um, for example, donors, um, who would be interested in like having this information to then provide feedback on, on proposals. So basically this toolkit is not meant for caseworkers, for example, or for facilitators of life skills activities. It's really meant for project managers and, and, and above who are involved in uh, project design. So now let's look at the methodology that we have uh, developed for the design of prevention programs for, to prevent recruitment. So we start with the organization of data. So all the data that is collected during the context analysis is organized in a way that then it's used to inform programming. So as I mentioned in this data, we have data coming from the community, from the children and from uh, former CAFAG uh, as well so that they can share their perspective on what could have prevented uh, their recruitment, for example. The second step is to look at the prevention approaches. So there are some key prevention approaches that are largely inspired from the documents that uh, Selena has presented, where we look at uh, a number of, of approaches, which I'm gonna detail in a, in a minute. The third step is to develop objectives and outcomes that you want to achieve for this project and then to brainstorm interventions. And this fourth step here, uh, we are providing also some examples of interventions that have been successful or likely successful based on anecdotal evidence from various contexts. And this is to help um, fellow practitioners to think outside of the box. We know quite often uh, prevention interventions are focused on awareness raising or um, this type of intervention. So here we're trying to encourage people to think outside of this typical intervention. So now let's look more specifically at those key prevention approaches. So the first one is to address risk factors and strengthen protective factors. So this is very similar to uh, what Selena has mentioned earlier. So it's identifying those factors um, that will then uh, inform the program. The second one is the community level approach and the multi-sectoral approach. So let's look at the first one. This one is what I would say almost the most important one. Um, so it's to identify and then address those risk factors that contribute to recruitment and then strengthen the protective factors. In any context, children can be more or less vulnerable to recruitment. And so if a child is exposed to a higher number of risk factor than protective factor, then this will likely increase their vulnerability and they may be at greater risk of experiencing recruitment. So for example, if we look at this diagram, here we have more risk factors than protective factors. And in this situation, uh, we have a cumulative effect, like risk factors are adding to, um, to each other, which will increase uh, the likelihood of recruitment. On the other hand, if we increase the number of protective factors, this may act um, to counterbalance the risk factors. And then this will increase uh, the children and families coping capacity and their resilience uh, to prevent recruitment. In that situation, if we manage to strengthen those protective factors so they are 
stronger, more prevalent, and then we decrease or address the risk factors, then in that situation, we, we have lower risk of recruitment. So building on this, once you have identified your protective and risk factors, we suggest that they are organized around the socioecological uh, levels of um, um, the socioecological levels. So you have this example of a table where you have protective factors, a number of them are actually called quote unquote universal, which may apply in, in most settings. And then you have risk factors um, that should be really identified locally uh, at, um, uh, in each context. And then once they organize in this way, then it's easier to look at what kind of interventions can we implement to address those risks or to strengthen the protective factors, right? So that's really the, the main approach. Now let's look at um, the second approach, which is a community level approach. Here, the intention is to support the community members so that they're able to protect uh, their children. One of the first approach uh, step is to first assess and then understand how communities naturally protect their children. And who are those influential people? Who are those key players in the community who have the power to influence social norms? Who have the power to say that recruitment is not acceptable in your community? Who have the power to say children should be in schools? And let's try to put the system in place so that children are not recruited. Right, so you have those key, um, what I call allies often uh, in the community who have a lot more power than any NGO to influence how, to, how people, how the community perceive recruitment of children. And the last point here is uh, to strengthen those existing protective mechanism for community mobilization, for capacity strengthening, for empowering those community members uh, to strengthen existing mechanism. Uh, it can be also to organize them in networks. So you may have some community leaders who want to prevent recruitment, but they feel really alone. But if you organize them in the group, then they feel stronger. It's not just one community who's trying to resist recruitment, but then it's multiple who can support each other. And then you don't feel uh, so lonely anymore. So these are the type of uh, community level intervention and approach that can be implemented. And the last one is um, the key uh, is the multi-sectoral approach. So in this situation, we look at child protection uh, at the center, but we know so that alone, we won't be able to fully address or prevent recruitment. And so let's work with other sectors who have their own expertise to address those risk factors who have been identified. So if we think of education, we know that the lack of um, quality secondary education in some places is a risk factor to recruitment. So let's engage our colleagues from education to help us in providing those services that will then reduce the likelihood of recruitment. We know that uh, poverty, the lack of um, income, stable income is also a risk factor. Then let's engage the livelihood uh, sector. We know that uh, food insecurity is also a risk factor. That the feeling of injustice is another risk factor. Uh, we know that conflict between uh, various communities or between um, tribes is also a risk factor. So let's work with all the other sectors so that all together we can contribute to addressing those risk factors and, and reducing the likelihood of, of recruitment. So that was a quick overview of the key approaches that we we're suggesting in this toolkit. And then we give quite a lot of tools to really organize the data and then guide uh, for this process of, of brainstorming activities or brainstorming interventions to develop um, prevention interventions. Now I, I'd like to invite you to a quick brainstorming. So this is a table 
that um, is has been put on uh, what's it called uh, group map. So if we can have the link to group map in the chat, so I invite you to click on this link and think of for each of those activity. Uh, for each of those um, protective factors and risk factors, what are the type of activity, what type of intervention that in your own organization you can implement to address them? So if we look at the first one, um, what is the type of uh, intervention that can promote the ability of youth to find meaning in life, to problem solve, and to adapt to new situations? Or if we look at that one, what type of activity can you implement to address extreme poverty, domestic violence, and poor family relationship? So let's take just a few minutes to, uh, to have this brainstorming exercise. So I'm gonna stop sharing this um, so that you can see the, the link. And I'd like also to invite the other panelists to think about how their intervention can fit into this table as well. Do I need the panelists, uh, other panelists have quick reflections on this while everyone's filling in the group map? Yeah, I'm going to share again my screen so that you can see this, uh, the table, and then we can follow. Um... But yeah, if a panelist though wants to, to share, like, feel free, or, or you can add to the table directly. Oops, here it is. Right, okay, so we see already some nice intervention. I see the first one is um, to create activities for, um, good for creating meaning, especially, yeah, structured and much PSS activity, life skills programming, yeah. So typically these are interventions that will help youth to feel uh, to have the skills to problem solve, to be more resilient if there is a new situation that arises in their life. Sound education, resilience activities, yeah, exactly. Um, now let's look at the um, addressing risk factors. So we have advocacy, oh, what HCTs, I'm not sure what this is. Peace operation on the importance for protection, prevention, and response. Tackle the arm industry in the unregulated cells. Okay, so here, um, I know this table is not so user friendly, but basically, the first one in red is the individual level. The second one is the family level, the yellow is the community, and the green is the um, society level. All right, I think I reached my time. So thank you all for your contributions. Thank you very much, Sandra. I, I think there's so much to digest there and I, I wish we had more time to yeah. discuss. Um, I think you do have a couple of more, uh, a couple more minutes, but I just wanted to- Oh, do I? Okay. There, there was, um, so there was a question that came in about, I know we will have a Q&A at the end, but there was a question about this, the community approach, um, which is also addressing some of the protective factors while addressing risk factors. So I guess a question I had is, you were talking about these three different approaches, but are they three different approaches or are they three different ways of getting to that you use all together? I guess that was my mm. question. They, they, they work together. Yeah, you can definitely use a community approach to then address a risk factor. Absolutely, they work. And that's why I said this, 
the first uh, approach in a way is the, so addressing risk uh, factors and strengthening protective factors is the main one. And then the others are just add on. So then to think of how to engage a community, how to engage other sectors or add, uh, add on to the first one. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. And I wish we had more time to go, go through this. Um, but unfortunately we do have to move on because uh, we have another wonderful presentation coming up. So I'm handing over to Hannah, Jasminka and Caroline to speak about innovative approaches to community led negotiations uh, with armed actors for self protection and access. And Hannah, I believe you are going to start. So the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Erica. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, and thank you so much, Sandra, for really um, easy um, handing over because I have, um, I love participating in um, these sessions because they, they generate so many cross-cutting ideas and, and, um, and possibilities. So thank you so much for that. Um, my name is Hannah Jordan. I'm the Regional Protection Advisor for the Norwegian Refugee Council for our Asia, Europe, and Latin America region. Um, would it be possible to share the presentation? Yes, of course. Perfect, okay. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is a project that NRC has with Save the Children Sweden. And it actually is looking at um, what I would actually say the community protective factors that you were talking about, Sandra. So it's a really perfect um, lead in to what we're gonna talk about today is really looking at um, what are some ways that the community, what are some community protective factors um, around prevention and what in this project that we're really focusing on is humanitarian negotiations um, and specifically specifically community led um, negotiations for access and protection. Um, and, and so I, my seven minutes will specifically um, talk about this project and then I'll hand over to Caroline from Save the Children to talk about community led um, protection approaches. <laughs> so the project that NRC and Save the Children have is we're really looking at support to and influencing of the wider humanitarian sector on innovative approaches to community-led negotiations with armed actors. Next slide. So an introduction to the project. We know that communities engage with different armed actors on a daily basis. Um, these engagements range from hostage negotiations to criminal justice, to dispute re um, resolution, to negotiating local ceasefires, to, to providing and negotiating access to different services, to different roads, to, to protection. Um, and humanitarian actors, we frequently operate in these contexts. Um, and we have, and we know that communities have these existing relationships with different armed actors and that these relationships evolve over time. So this project is really looking at, do humanitarians have a role in supporting communities on these negotiations? And if we do have a role, what is that role? We don't want to assume that we have a role, but we're really trying to look through this project as if we do, what does that, what is that role? And the intended outcome of this project is really to identify good practices um, for the humanitarian community, not just for NRC and Save the Children, in local engagement and negotiations with armed actors. So as I said, the main and the key questions are one, what roles do communities take in negotiations for access and protection? So what roles do community leaders, do community groups take in actually um, negotiating with armed actors for um, different protective objectives for their community and also for their community um, to um, access services? Um, can and should humanitarian support communities in these negotiations. So what is our role in doing that? Is that a capacity building role? So supporting the strengthening of those negotiation capacities? Is it um, to support communities on negotiating themselves? And then also how can humanitarians do this in a principled way without causing harm and without impeding communities? Um, so this project, it started last year and it's gonna be going into April of next year. And we're doing um, research in three countries, so South Sudan, Colombia, and Ukraine. Um, I hear it, it's, hopefully that's okay. Um, we're also going to be looking at which m and &E systems and tools can we design for monitoring and evaluating and learning from our work on community-led negotiations. 
So basically, how do we monitor prevention work? How do we monitor something that if successful, it didn't happen? And what does this look like? And then also guidance for project staff on community-led negotiations and the role of humanitarian actors in these interventions. So we're really looking at negotiations as a self-protection mechanism for communities and what is our role within that. Um, we're, we're conducting the research for this project over the next couple of months. And by the end of the grant and project, we should have some ideas about this m and &E systems and how to actually monitor this, which hopefully will lead into testing some of these approaches. Um, yeah, so um, I know I have two other presenters, so I don't want to take up too much time, but does anyone have any questions or can we move on to Caroline? Okay, Caroline, over to you. Sorry, I think we were moving on to Jasminka next, but... Oh, sorry, Jasminka. <laughs> No, I mean, it's fine. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to, to everyone. And it's, it's a nice opportunity actually to speak uh, about Ukraine. So we are flying to Ukraine and the presentation that I prepare addresses the role of children. I mean, we, we heard about children from the previous presenters. The role of children in negotiations with military and civilian authorities for access to services and the benefits to advocacy towards prevention when informed by children. So I have put a question to you as the audience uh, on this, which we can reflect on at the end of this presentation. In May uh, 2021, which means four months ago, uh, Save the Children in Ukraine published a report which is called Safety Through the Eyes of Children, which analyzed the findings of research conducted with the participation of children. So these children were already part of so-called school safety committees, a project of Save the Children, which I'll come to later. The value of the research lies in the ability of children to contribute to the creation of a better community through the engagement and support the process of identifying how the community perceive protection and what needs to be done to ensure children and communities living in conflict are better protected. So this participatory research that we conducted four months ago looked at safety issues children living in the conflict in Eastern Ukraine are facing. The survey was conducted in consultations with children. This is something that we insist on and with their direct involvement in data collection. Uh, in the research, we analyzed children's safety uh, and we actually engaged 18 schools at the contact line and 43 schools located further from the contact line dividing non-government control area and the government control area. Can we switch to slide two, please? As you can see from these two questions in particular, there are clear areas of protection concerns being reported by children and significant proportion who feel like these threats are beyond their capacity to protect themselves. Can we switch to slide three, please? The research also looked at who children feel can protect them with a range of responses, but parents and school uh, authorities featured most uh, highly, which is something that we anticipated. According to the results of the research, we discovered that close cooperation between the children and authorities, which means military, police, service for children, Department of Social Protection of the Population, Service for Family, Children and Youth, and many others, that link is missing and that cooperation is missing. The children living along the contact line are not familiar with the authorities uh, at different levels. They can turn to if their rights are being violated or in case some threats to their life and health emerge. Unfortunately, there are no efficient referral pathway mechanisms as a way of solving problems, which is why it's essential to incorporate those recommendations from the research in our advocacy with the duty bearers. Despite initial ignorance from the side of government regarding involvement of children in a country with conflicts such as Ukraine, we introduced new concepts such as child participation, something that Hannah uh, referred to child's governance predominantly in support of advocacy around the safe schools declaration. We link local with global and in collaboration with children as the key stakeholders and by working with and for children, 
We use field experience to create opportunities and engage with the duty bearers. As mentioned at the start of this presentation, since 2017, we piloted and scaled up the so-called schools and as zones of peace approach in a number of schools in government control areas and non-government control areas to address conflict-related safety issues in schools involving children, teachers, and parents. So that triangle is very important for us. Schools as zones of peace aims to secure safe learning environments in conflict settings, raise awareness among communities, school management, and children, and build local and national level engagement to protect education. As part of the same approach so far, we have established 440 school safety committees along government control areas. Those committees carried out risk and resource mapping to identify risk and developed school action plans outlining mitigation of identified risk risks. As the main task of the committee was to mobilize school communities to respond to existing challenges, each school created and updated its own action plan with very concrete steps to overcome existing risk for children outside school and inside school and on the way uh, to school. This plan was based on the risk mapping of the school and nearby area inside the community. This work at the grassroots level is complemented by child-led advocacy and advocacy at the national level for both endorsement and implementation of the Safe Schools Declaration by the government of Ukraine, which has uplifted, uplifted conflict-affected children's voices to raise awareness and promote protection of education from attacks. School safety committees are feeding the findings deriving from their work into briefings and dialogues on safe schools guidelines to militaries, other armed factors, uh, actors and decision makers in Ukraine. So far, children would communicate with national education decision makers, and our intention is to involve them in community protection and access dialogues in Eastern Ukraine so that they can act as the actors of change in prevention and response efforts. By doing that, we believe we will improve our relations with armed forces and humanitarian negotiations work, which is outlined in the Save the Children Civil Military work, and it showcases how dialogues with armed actors and decision makers in Save the Children work in Ukraine are shaped by both community members and the children from school safety committees. Once again, let me emphasize that these committees inform the advocacy around implementing the Safe Schools Declaration and the guidelines for protecting schools and universities from military use during armed conflict, with civil military work and collaboration with the Ministry of Defense being one of the key components. Safe Schools Declaration and the guidelines, as you all know, are the only international documents dedicated exclusively to the safety of schools, children and teachers in the context of armed conflicts. To conclude, these are just some examples how we can empower children to build self-confidence and become agents of change in their communities, exercising child participation negotiations with civil and military actors and advocating at different levels for realization of child rights and the prevention of harm to children. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jasminka. I think we 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 did apologies. We did the we didn't do the group map before you presented. So maybe we could do the first group map uh, question now. Uh, just sorry, I'm reading the the group map, and I think it's. <laughs> I mean, it should be obvious, but the, there's the question of to what extent do you think humanitarians should be leading negotiations with armed actors on behalf of communities. Uh, in restricted access and protection context. And there are four options for you there. Um, so yes, I'll be interested to hear what, um, uh, what, what the thoughts are. It's interesting, I, I'm just looking quickly at, at the response. It seems to be- Now it seems that I've got 100%. Okay, great. So can you just show the show the results there? Yes, sure. I mean, I think Which we all is... saw them when we logged on, but um, I, I think it's quite interesting that the first two options 
uh, seem to make up the vast majority of, of the responses. Um, so Hannah and Jasminka, I'm wondering what your, this is your poll, so what were your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I may maybe start uh, in, in terms of humanitarians uh, leading negotiations with armed actors uh, on the behalf of communities in, in restricted access and protection context. I think that, uh, you know, we, I clearly somehow outlined in the presentation that, uh, yes, we want to be a part of the process as humanitarian actors, but we want to, uh, as much as possible, uh, of course, um, looking at safety and security issues and not uh, actually doing anything that could harm in any way uh, children and communities. Uh, we want to bring them to the table. We want to bring both community members and children and youth to the table. And, you know, uh, for the time being, as I said, we are doing that uh, at the level of the Ministry of Education, but we are surely, but, but slowly somehow moving uh, towards the defense uh, structures. And, you know, we, we started maybe a couple of years ago in a very indirect way, but more and more uh, we are having those uh, more direct uh, gatherings between the children and youth. Uh, we are training uh, civil militaries on the Safe Schools Declaration. We are slowly somehow incorporating into the curriculum uh, those issues that we are covering naturally as Save the Children, such as uh, child protection and education and emergency, so that they see it's not just, um, you know, that party on the other side uh, of the battlefield. It's also, you know, those children who they need to think about. It's about, you know, child rights. It's about all those things that usually uh, civil militaries do not really think because they have, according to them, some more important job to do. So I, I think that, you know, we are in a way acting as um, sometimes eye opener to them. And to be honest, I think that that's, that's a very, very good way of, um, you know, one, educating them, uh, two, uh, make sure, making sure that they are becoming more uh, an allies to everything that we are doing, because there has to be some synergy between what humanitarian players are doing and what uh, civil military people are doing. Great, thanks very much. And I think we'll, we'll move to, to Caroline now. And I don't know if you wanted to do the group map before your presentation or after. I don't have the <coughs> group map. Oh, there is another one. Yeah, uh, that is Jasminka's one. Oh, sorry. So we're, 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 we're one no behind. behind. So sorry the one you that. just showed was Hannah's. Oh, I'm so sorry, Hannah. But, um, yes, Mika, but, shall we share yours now? It's in the capable hands of Catherine. The, All the right. <laughs> okay. So there's, yes, there's another one, the second one. So I will um, share the, the same link again, and I'll release the second part of um, the question. And, um, and then Erica, you can speak us through um, the answers to those as well and then we can go into Caroline's presentation. So do that. you think children have a role in negotiations for access to services <coughs> excuse me with military authorities is the question. Yes am I I got that right? Yes that that's right so if you click on the same link again it should have taken you to the second question or if Let you were already in there, you can just click um, continue survey. <coughs> Give me a thumbs up in the chat or on your screen if that's if that's working for you. Yeah. Great. So why don't we, while people are filling that in, Car uh, Caroline, do you want to go through your presentation and maybe we can look at the results at the end? Yes, that seems, uh, that seems fine. And then Yasminka will get back to you to, uh, to give a little analysis of the, of the poll. Catherine, would it be possible to show the slides again?
you. Um, okay, so my role is to zoom out a little bit um, and explain how the community-led negotiations with armed actors project will be linked to the broader evidence-based approach that Save the Children and War Child are currently developing, focusing on community-led child protection. And Sandra, you asked where the other presenters come in. We come in in relation to your community-level approaches to preventing recruitment and use of, uh, of children. So in a way, we're, we're also linking to, um, to your project. Um, and basically, why are we developing this broader approach on community-led child protection? And also, how is, is this relevant for the prevention of harm to children in conflict? Because that is the frame of this uh, session. And it's very good that I see myself on video because that would avoid that I start talking um, like in Italian. Um, so I'm going to put my hands down. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So what, what do we know? Um, we know that communities across context and also settings are in most cases the first line actors to prevent and also respond to harms to children. But um, communities are also the site of violence against children, in particular in, in conflict settings with communities facing threats to their ability to keep children safe as a result of violence, loss of livelihood opportunities, or migration and, and displacement. And what we also know is that our current engagement with communities on child protection tends to focus on setting up and strengthening various kinds of community-based child protection mechanisms, like, uh, well, I think that most of us here in this session uh, have been engaging with child protection committees, children's clubs, youth groups. And this is basically a practice which has been recognized for years by child protection actors, uh, donors, academics, governments, as the key community level approach on child protection. Yet, two global interagency evidence reviews, one from 2009 and the most more recent one from 2018, which was conducted by the Alliance, tell us that these approaches tend to limit community ownership and sustainability. And in particular, um, when they are driven by external agendas, limited recognition and inclusion of local realities. And while these approaches and, um, are, are implemented in the community, they do not always come from the community. Next slide. So the approach that we are developing um, uh, will, first of all, uh, guide country offices to reflect on the current levels of community ownership in their existing child protection programming. So starting the journey to shift powers with a reflection on current practice. And questions we ask child protection teams include, for example, are you entering the community as a learner and listener or rather as an expert? Do you engage with the community following their pace or rather the NGO or donor's timeline? Who holds the power and takes the decision in relation to harms the community will address, the actions that will be taken and the actors or community structures that will be involved? And based on that reflection, child protection teams are then guided to identify opportunities to give space and seed power to communities to protect their children in an inclusive way. The overall aim of the approach is to strengthen the protective environment for children within the communities using a child protection systems approach, building on already existing formal and definitely also informal community approaches, resources and capacities to protect children which includes endogenous approaches to prevention, the topic of this alliance uh, annual meeting, or referring back to the previous speakers, community experiences and, and strengths related to um, engagement and, and negotiations with armed actors. And because these initiatives will be locally owned and managed by communities themselves using their 
intrinsic motivation and, and drive, they are likely to be more sustainable. And lastly, um, the approach built on ongoing research by Professor Mike Wessels of the Child Resilience Alliance, conducted in Sierra Leone, Kenya, and India. And a very quick side note, the research uh, in, and, and the work that's being done in, in Kenya uh, will be presented tomorrow during the thematic session or it is, I think. Um, and as Save the Children and War Child, we are conduct conducting re research and gathering uh, learning in different countries across regions. And I think uh, up to 15 countries uh, will, will be involved um, to broaden the evidence base related to the effectiveness of using a community-led approach, focusing on both development context and also humanitarian action. And that will definitely include um, conflict settings. So um, this is basically the broader scope of the work that both Hannah and Yasminka have been talking about. So more on this in probably somewhere the end of uh, 2020. Thank you. And I don't know if there are any um, any questions in relation to this before handing over to you, Yasminka. I think we're going to get questions at the end um, okay, because good. we are kind of very tight on time at the moment. So um, if we could just, Catherine, if we could just see the poll results um, and then we can talk about it in, in the question session after, uh, after the other Catherine <laughs> speaks. So if you're just able to show us the result now. So it looks like we have 57% that children have a role um, versus, well, actually, we've got 61% say they, they should have some role and 39% say should not be involved. So that's very interesting. Um, right. I, apologies for, for now cutting, cutting you short uh, on your presentation, which was absolutely fascinating but i think we need to to move on now to just so that we make sure everyone has time uh, and hopefully we have time for questions um so i'd like to hand you over to uh, Kath, uh to catherine who i believe tim is not <laughs> able to join us at one in the one in the morning is that is that what's happened oh, um tim, tim is with us now. oh he is oh great Welcome, Tim. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, turning over to both of you from the Dallaire, uh, Dallaire Institute um, to look at their knowledge for prevention project and the early early warning modeling, which I have a difficulty saying. Uh, Catherine, please go ahead. Wonderful. Thanks, Erica. So, Catherine, if we could have our presentation, that would be lovely. Great, and apologies in advance. My uh, puppy has been sleeping for six hours straight and has decided to uh, voice her, her participation in our discussion today as soon as I start to speak. So uh, welcome, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Bailey Abadie and I'm joined with my colleague, Tim Lineman, and we are from the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. Catherine, if you could move to the next slide, that would be great. So our organization was founded by General Romeo Dallaire over 10 years ago, based on his experiences in Rwanda, uh, witnessing and, and engaging with children who had been recruited and used. And for General Dallaire, what he observed after and reflected on post that experience was perhaps a missing role for the security sector's engagement in preventing recruitment. So we saw lots of excellent um, organizations, many of which we've heard from today, doing really great work to create enhanced protection for children, but perhaps an opportunity that was not realized yet for the security sector's role in, in this work as well. So if we could move to the next slide. Great, thank you, Kevin. So in one of the elements that we do at the Dallaire Institute in terms of preventing recruitment and use is our research uh, work. 
And so this particular project, which we call Knowledge for Prevention, is an example of that. So we call this K4P, and K4P has three main elements uh, for the project. So first is our development of an early warning system focused on recruitment and use. And I wanted to just highlight that for the last year and a half, we've been working on creating a predictive model to be able to predict the likelihood of recruitment and use in a given context. And Tim will be speaking a little bit more to the specificity of the model in a moment. But I just want to, to say that this we saw as a gap and a need for us to better understand the likelihood of recruitment at a much earlier stage in the recruitment spectrum. So this was a response to something we had been observing as, as a gap in our work. The second element for K4P for us is was looking at other conflict early warning systems and whether they were considering children. So Sandra, in your when you asked us to think about where our work falls, certainly our work falls in the community and society level prevention work. For us, we're really focused on children being centered in peace and security. And no surprise to most people in joining us today, children are very much excluded from conflict early warning systems. Um, there is very little indicators focused on children and certainly no recruitment indicators at all. So in addition to building our own early warning system, we're working with partners to encourage more child-centered indicators so we can have a better understanding of children's risk. The third element for us is bridging communities. So we're working closely with practitioners, with community, with researchers, and with the security sector. And we see a real opportunity to bring communities together for innovative solutions and considering possibilities for enhanced protection. One of the ways in which we're doing that is we've created a community of practice, which now has over 100 members. We convene on a quarterly basis to talk about some of the challenges we experience in this work, some of the solutions that have been working at community or national levels, and to talk about how we can work better together as a broader community across different sectors to improve our prevention work related to recruitment. So I think I will at this point stop and pass it over to Tim to explain our modeling and our system. Well, while we're waiting for Tim to come back on, does anyone have any questions on what Catherine has been talking about? Okay, well, I, I will ask a question. Okay, <laughs> I will ask you. a question then uh, while we're waiting. While we're waiting, it, I mean, this is is a fascinating area. I I think, and and you're absolutely right. Where where we have this huge gap in um, any kind of early warning systems or discuss context analysis discussions focusing on children generally. You know, forget that they don't even do that. But certainly not the risks of child recruitment, and. But how do we make this, I, I guess it's, can, is there a way that we can be pursuing both at the same time of, of kind of reducing that vulnerability for children at risk, but also I, I know a lot of the work you do is, is around changing the behavior of armed actors. So, so how are those two coming together? Mm, great question, thank you. So for us, we are looking at, if we go back to Sandra's, um, um, table and we're looking at sort of society level understanding of children and children's role in broader peace and security. So there's a, a, a strong advocacy element here around shifting norms so that children are centered and recognized as strategically important in peace and security, which I think all of us can you know, frustratingly agree that that's not the case today. On the behaviors and actions, this was back to General Dallaire's early observations. There's an opportunity to expect different things from state actors, train state actors differently, and um, work towards increasing skill, behavior, and action that presents children as being 
um, different than just victims in an armed conflict, but having agency and the capacity to participate differently. So our, our work is really connected. I should have said this element of our predictive model is really our research side where we're trying to demonstrate context. We also have a, of a branch or a division in our, our, our work that's focused on training with security actors, largely military and police. So it's taking this contextual analysis and providing it in a training situation where we're teaching prevention related skills and more falling into the secondary prevention. So looking at children at risk, how do security actors monitor and patrol and report and observe differently so we can reduce the, the likelihood of a child being recruited. So how do you elevate um, elevate your reports in a way that recognize the significant risk in a particular community? How do you respond in a way that's effective working with children who have um, largely been exposed to and survived many forms of trauma and violence? And so teaching peacekeepers and, and other security actors about how their behavior matters in the context of their practice and how the rules need to change to make sure that uh, children are being respected as, as significant and important in peace and security. Absolutely great. Thank, thank you for that. Hello, everybody. Uh, apologies for the technical glitch. That's entirely my fault. And uh, thank you for being here. So at Dalea, we take an early warning system as very much a socio-technical system that's designed to support people to take effective action to achieve an outcome. So Catherine has gone through the outcomes that we're after and essentially to reduce the likelihood that children will be recruited and used in armed conflict. For us, uh, an early warning system is really centered on people. So the people, action doesn't happen without people. So people have to know and trust and believe in the early warning system in order to effectively use it. So really it's it's very much understanding people, understanding people's needs, how they would respond to early warnings, what they would do that is at the center of what we do. Second component of early warning system is of course data and we've struggled to generate and get the data that we need and have taken on actually building our own data sets to get more reliable uh, outcome variables for the data. We also use a likelihood modeling approach that we um, model the likelihood that child soldiers would be recruited and used in a country in a year and we try and do that two years in advance so that we've got a long time lead up to plan and prepare any actions. We link that to a much more focused trigger or accelerator tracking, which is really looking at ongoing unfolding events in a particular country that we can see whether or not uh, things are changing. So we anticipate that as the context changes, the probability of recruitment and use might change. And we try and access that through the trigger and accelerator modeling. We also look at local attack probabilities and can try and identify where in space attacks are likely to occur and that can inform teams on the ground. The process part of an early warning system for us is we do an annual data and model update. So we update the model with the latest data that we have. We update our forecasts every six months. We produce weekly trigger or accelerator assessments and as needed attack probabilities and likelihood estimation so that we can update for a specific situation what our predictions are. And all of this is within the scope of working continuously with users so that they understand, trust and accept the results. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to go sort of uh, in a squiggledy fashion through this slide from the top left data, uh, going down to the bottom and then looping through to the right to uh, just illustrate some of those elements that we're working with. So data we've developed 
but uh, a big challenge for us in terms of modeling recruitment and use of child soldiers is to identify an outcome data set. So the outcome is this group has or has not used child soldiers in this country in this year. So it's a group by country by year. And so we've developed our own data set with uh, close to 2000 observations of all non-state actors in the UCDP data set between 2010 to it's now 2020. And that's the basis of our modeling. We then use Bayesian network likelihood modeling to uh, explore a range of predictors. So what variables at a country or group or conflict scale uh, reliably predict the recruitment and use of child soldiers. So that network model at the bottom left is our uh, preliminary model, which we're in the process of updating. And that shows that the use of child soldiers by government forces, whether or not the group has been previously active, whether or not the conflict was an attack, and the duration of the conflict are important predictors of the recruitment and use of child soldiers. Then moving up to that central column, if you like, the weekly trigger accelerator modeling. We use uh, ICU's data, which is machine coded news data that uh, is produced uh, from the US and we update a, a weekly worry list. So every week we track globally, every country in the world identify shifts or changes in the trends of media reports that would inform us of the likelihood that the recruitment and use probability that we've estimated with the models might be changing. And the, the K4P team makes decisions as to whether to take further action or not. And then lastly, that the maps on the right hand side are from Cabo Delgado in northern Mozambique, where there's an ongoing um, conflict, as many of you may know. The left hand side is just a map with some ACLED data on uh, attacks on civilians. And the right hand map is a probability of civilian attacks that we've used with the, the bright red being the highest probability of attacks. So with that, we can look at how many children are in those areas and are at greatest risk. And we can look at what areas are um, requiring urgent attention to reduce the risk. And that's the end from me and back to Catherine. Thanks, Jim. Uh, that's great. Sorry, it wasn't quite the end from me. That, that basically <laughs> everything revolves around the decision maker and the decisions they have to make. An early warning system is only a tool to enhance the capabilities of decision makers. Thank you. Great, thanks, Tim. If we can move to the next slide, and Erica, I know we're we're really pressed for time, so I'll, I'll wrap up here with just a, a couple of points for the final two slides. But to respond to the question um, in the chat about who the data is used, uh, who's using the data, currently it's it's an internal process. So we produce a worry list, areas of changing context or increased worry, and internally we make decisions on how we can share that information with relevant bodies, whether they're community level, national or regional. And so right now the, the data is not publicly available, but we're working with uh, teams to see how we can uh, scale up this project so that we can have a much more public facing experience. I just quickly highlight that for in Mozambique, uh, we were flagging the likelihood of recruitment of children, the high likelihood in January, 2020. And so this, uh, the, our model, our wish is that we're one and a half to two years out from recruitment happening, that we're able to raise flags and raise warnings so that early action and intervention can take place to prevent recruitment from happening in the first place. And if anyone would like to touch base with Tim or I to speak a little bit more about our experience in Mozambique and the resulting interventions that uh, have us working directly with the state forces now to do training, we'd be happy to do that at a, at a different time. 
maybe the last um, slide, Catherine, please. So just want to say in terms of where we're going next, I think there was a, a question as well about the accessibility of our model. We have a, a fully functioning, uh, capable model now, and we're in the process of, of building the, the early warning system around our, our work. So we are engaging with partners to imagine what data we need to enhance our predictive ability who we would partner with. So there's an element here on the research side, as well as the advocacy and intervention side that we're, we're continuing to, to build at this time. I, just because of how short we are in time, I'll stop there. I thank you for joining us. Tim and I are available. You can reach us um, with our email there, and we'd be happy to, to follow up if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine and Tim. Yes, I do feel like we needed an entire session on on that model, um, and unfortunately, we are sort of running out of running out of time. There are a few questions, some of which you've already answered, but um, one question I just wanted to pick out in terms of of the early warning signs. One of the questions is: Is the prevalence of light arms in a country part of this early warning approach? So that's just a quick hopefully quick response. Um, this is Tim. No, currently that's okay. not part of the early warning predictor set. Okay. Uh, and then there, there was a question around, do we yet have any, um, uh, do, we, do we yet have any examples where we've seen this has led to practical decisions that have changed um change protection so that um so that so that it is leading uh, like basically it are there decisions that have been made to prevent to take action to prevent child recruitment that's what i was trying to say sorry i think for us mozambique was really our first trial of using the early warning system and then certainly we're seeing recruitment and we have confirmation of recruitment we also have interventions that have started rather rather quickly, not quick enough, of course, um, in terms of trying to mitigate uh, recruitment. So this is early days of this system and uh, we're looking forward to, to work with, with many of you on the call today to see how we can work together to make sure this model is, is as successful as it can be. Great, I think we are also looking forward to it. Um, Catherine, can you put up the last slide with everyone's contact details while I just go through a last question that's come up? For Caroline, uh, I, the question is, and, and this may not be a quick answer, but what do you do in a situation where the community in the, in the driving seat seeks, seeks protection in ways that humanitarian organization can't or won't address? Yeah, I know, not, not a simple question. I read the question. Maybe Jason, we can have a bilateral on that. I think the starting point would still be um, to engage with the community to see uh, if there are ways for themselves to, to for themselves to protect uh, to, to to keep children safe in the community. Um, the interesting thing is is that I said that it's applicable across context, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but there are there are situations in which a community-led approach might not be appropriate. One of them being a rapid onset emergency where you can't normally you need community-led approach takes time to build trust, et cetera, et cetera. There are phases in the approach, which is not necessarily appropriate in a rapid onset emergency because uh, it's all about saving lives. And we will come in uh, to, to uh, engage with the community, but, but also um, to, to intervene and, and, and save lives. Um, so uh, there, there, there are, it, I think it takes too much time uh, and there's not one answer to your question because I think you can look at it from, from different angles. Um, so let, let me just stop there before okay. yeah. I go in too many different directions. I know it's always these complicated questions that seem to come out when we don't have enough time. Um, yes, and I do wish we had it, had more time. Here's up the list, I put up the list, uh, or Catherine's put up the list of how you can contact the individuals. Uh, I think all of the presentations are going to be in the resources um, anyway. So you'll be able to find find, <coughs> excuse me, find those as well. 
Um, we just have, I just have enough time to say thank you very much to everyone who joined. Uh, I really wish we could discuss some of these things more. There is a session, <coughs> excuse me, on Wednesday on children and armed conflict and accountability. So I don't know if there's going to be space and if some of this will come up there. Um, so it's worth joining that. Uh, and then we have, uh, I, I've been told to remind you that as soon as we log off here, you have to log back on to the main session for the final plenary for the end of the day. Uh, so to make sure you have time to do that, I just want to give a huge round of applause to, which I would do if we were all in the same room, um, to everyone who presented today. It's been absolutely fascinating um, and there's so much work going on in an area that personally I feel is very much underrepresented um, in the children and child protection and emergencies field. So thank you all very much. And uh, any final word anyone wants to say on the panel, I think we have about 90 seconds. Maybe just thank you very much for joining. And if you're interested in our community of practice, we have what we call quarterly research labs where we come together and just problem solve together. You're most welcome to, to join us and, and we would look forward to working with you. Great, I, I will certainly be signing up if, if I can. Mm -hmm.